All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kate. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, The Power of SAP HANA, the SAP HANA Platform, Integrating Non-SAP Data with Custom HANA Applications. Uh, you'll hear from three people at Dickinson and Associates today, first from Rob Jerome, our Vice President of Innovation and Technology, and then from Lead, Ar Lead Architect of BI, Tim Corba, and Senior Consultant, Wes Feimster. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them using the Q&A dialog box. We'll be answering questions after the presentation and demo, and I'll hand things off to Rob. Great. Great. Thanks, Kate. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks, everybody, for attending our webinar today. Um, this is the, the, the first in our uh, Q4 series of webinars that we're going to do between now and the end of the year, and we're really excited about this one. Um, primarily because most often we hear about HANA as this really fast database or a way to accelerate our ERP or really to run analytics. And what we really wanted to focus on today is what I'll call the, the non-traditional use case, where maybe we're not dealing with SAP data. It's non-SAP data coming into HANA, and we're building an application that isn't necessarily specific to SAP. It's a custom application. So as Tim Corba and, and Wes Feimster uh, go through our webinar today, you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about more advanced HANA application development capabilities and really the power of SAP data integration solutions that can um, bring on SAP data into a HANA system. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to um, Tim Corba and Wes for the uh, webinar, and once again, thank you very much for attending. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Let's get started with the presentation. So um, we're going to go over a couple of things. This is high-level agenda items that we will be discussing. We have a lot to cover throughout this because we will be showing you for, uh, two different portions of the demo, one from the, uh, the ETL standpoint or the data integration, and the other from the native application or, or that custom application portion within the HANA platform. So I always like to start off with a, a couple quotes. Um, that represents, you know, the topic that we're, we're really focusing on. And, and what you get, get from each of these quotes is um, big data is here and it's always here to stay. Everybody is out there tweeting and taking pictures and, and doing a lot, either from their iPads or their desktops or their mobile phones. And really we need to harness all of that information and present it in a way uh, that the end users as well as our businesses can consume that information efficiently and effectively. So just an overview of what non-SAP integration has been and where it's going now. Um, we, many of the people on the call, if you are an SAP customer, some of these buzzwords obviously you are familiar with. Uh, first and foremost, we would have SAP BW, which is the business warehousing solution um, that SAP has had over the last decade plus. And really, that solution uh, allows you to bring in the non-SAP as well as SAP data. But the difference from what we're going to be speaking about today is, in most cases, that was built on an ECC core system. So most of the data coming into the SAP BW environment was ECC, and then we had the integration of non-SAP data. But again, SAP information was part of that overall solution. SAP BW wasn't usually the normal use case for just independent non-SAP data. And then obviously we have SAP ECC from a conversion and interface standpoint. If you're bringing in legacy data from that third-party system and you're converting it into ECC or you're just interfacing it there. That was another way that currently how those that integration exists. But where we're really focusing on is the third point, SAP HANA. You know, we're talking about focused non-SAP solutions during this conversation and how we really can harness SAP HANA and the ETL tools that are provided in order to bring that data over and effectively use all that information within these nice, consistent web interfaces. So really following SAP's user interface experience vision and, go, and continuing down that path with SAP HANA as a platform. And as BW, there's many different ways to bring this 
uh, external data in. We have the business objects data services, which Wes is going to speak about very shortly. We also have things such as you could do a simplified flat files or a replication type of application server with SLT. And you also have uh, ideas and concepts such as smart data access, which will allow you to have that seamless integration with other um, databases such as Hadoop. Um, and really, uh, you know, harness all your information within your uh, your infrastructure within the SAP HANA platform. So within that, with that stated, we're going to talk about the first portion, which is the EPL standpoint. I'm going to hand it over to Wes for his overview of data services. Thanks, Tim. Uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. With SAP Data Services, you'll find an integrated, robust ETL platform for data processing. Um, having used it for some time now, I found it to be amazingly powerful and, and easy to use. And not just for the, the one-off migration tasks, uh, but also for periodically running batch jobs or, or even jobs that listen for new data to appear like in, in a poll directory folder. Um, <clears throat> there's there's uh, management reporting and, and administrative tools that are found in, in a web-based console. Data services is currently um, at version 4.2, Service Pack 5. And you can find tons more information uh, at the link down there at the bottom uh, of this slide. In terms of benefits, right? I'm a big proponent of the uh, of the data services platform for for a couple reasons. But first and foremost is the the wide variety of data you can connect to, uh, and and can give back to. I guess is is another point. But out of the box, you'll find multiple native database connectors. Oracle, MySQL, SQL, uh, you know, M, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, etc. You can also connect to applications. Of course, the, the typical SAP applications are there, uh, but you'll also find Siebel, JD Edwards, PeopleSoft, even the web-based services like SOAP are available. Um, in addition to database and, uh, databases and applications, uh, you can easily pull from more traditional sources like flat files and spreadsheets, and, and they're just so simple to, to connect to. Um, as I hope you'll see later, the, the graphical user interface is intuitive and, and allows you to easily uh, create your data flows. Um, you're able to add significant complexity and logic to your flows if you need to uh, through the built-in transforms and, and through, uh, through custom scripting. But the reality is uh, data services is, is, is a very flexible and, and intuitive platform, and the reality is you may not even need to go into the complexity you, uh, that I'm describing here because it's just easy out of the box. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tim, and he's going to discuss HANA in some more detail. Thanks, Les. Um, and just to, just to give a little bit more on data services, too, you know, this isn't – obviously, many of us are familiar with data services. It isn't a novelty concept, but really what we're trying to show – is that end-to-end -end integration across the board. A lot of people don't understand. So really taking that conceptual and applying a practical uh, environment that you can really take back to your colleagues and understand on, on how you may be able to take that information from those external non-SAP systems and integrate it directly in SAP HANA. So we, we, we've stated this term of SAP HANA in many ways, but what is it? And at a very high level, uh, it is that data source agnostic in memory database. You know, we've heard of buzzwords such as real time and big data and columnar storage and massive parallel processing, processing, and it's all of those. But it also is a little bit more than just a database. We also have a, a HANA application layer. So this is going to provide you that direct access to the database. It's not only the application layer, but it's also a dedicated web server. So in your current hardware infrastructure, you may have a Tomcat server that's accessing another transactional database to pull all this information, which will then be consumed by the front-end retailers or, or, or end users. Uh, think about both of those, these two bullet points, all within one appliance, and that makes up that HANA platform. And that's where you really could harness the overall, um, you know, benefits uh, for SAP HANA. So this just gives you a better visualization of what that platform looks like and the different components and how 
different types of users can leverage this HANA platform. It's really being reimagined and transformative. Think about if you had the capability to do your transactional, your analytical, your predictive, your sentiment, and your spatial processing all within one appliance. And that's really what this is doing. It's conforming where we're changing uh, how things used to be and we're making things uh, tremendously better. And the right, the right side, there's a bullet point that talks about supports any application. And it states 60% of HANA use cases are outside of the SAP landscape. And that really speaks volumes to where and how SAP HANA is being used moving forward. So now we've talked about the ETL standpoint. We've talked about the underlying what SAP HANA is as a platform and that it is a database. But now let's talk about that application side of things where it sits on top of your database. So what are native applications? Well, again, it's sitting, it's an application that sits and resides directly within the HANA data, database, and it's exposing that data. And there's three different tiers if you look at it from a visualization standpoint. We have the top tier, which is the front-end technology. This is where the end user sits. It's going to be your desktop, your mobile phone, your iPad. And with the technologies that are within, built in to, to the SAP native application framework, you have HTML5 and SAP UI5 that really create that responsive uh, front end. So regardless of what tool that you're using as an end user, this native application framework is allowing for that responsive nature out of the box without having to do extensive amount of, of effort. Then we have your control flow technologies and your data processing technologies. Now to simplify this, we have our control flow technologies. This is where your communication is between your database and your front end users. So this is where you're exposing that data to the end users and doing your different server, scratch, server side Java scripting. And then your database and data processing technologies, as, as you think of it, it's where your data sits. This is where you're doing your modeling that uh, to join multiple, multiple tables together in order for your control flow technologies to consume that information correctly, again, for the end users in that application. So we talked about SAP HANA platform. We talked a little bit about the native application development. Now let's talk about the overall UI platform that is delivered out of the box. It, it is made up of three main pieces. We have your SAP HANA Extended Services Engine or your XS Engine in short as an acronym. You also have your UI Integration Services and again, that SAP UI 5 portion that is also included. And by having all of these within one platform, it's a one-stop shop. It, you know, it reduces your overall TCU, TCO. So talking about the XS Engine, this is, this is something that is automatically activated after you import your uh, specific delivery units within SAP HANA, and, it's, and, and that, that activates the XS Engine. So at that point, it's acting now as an application, a web server, and it's exposing that HANA data. The UI integration services portion, that's where it's uh, that tightly integrated, it's, it's tightly integrated with SAP HANA Studio and providing you those development tools and APIs, the widgets, and basically overall the dedicated wizards that are gonna allow the de developer to create those applications, the front end applications that are um, you know, consistent uh, provide a consistent approach across each application that you create. And we talked about the UI5 again. That's really the global standard these days. It, it's SAP's HTML5 standard and their, its libraries that are within the native app application framework. And that really allows you to harmonize the overall user experience. Again, following SAP's vision of that SAP user experience um, transition that we're, we're currently within now. So obviously there's many different benefits for leveraging the SAP HANA platform to do this type of applic 
application development. Um, we've heard of many terms such as Fiori and uh, screen personas, and all of those are concepts that are built, again, upon the native application framework. Um, if you're going to ever, if you have Fiori um, screens that are SAP specific implemented and you wanted to extend those you would be using native application development to do that. So some of the other benefits for this is the obvious, but speed. You know, we talked about how it's an in-memory database already, but also having everything within one platform really creates that seamless and integration that provides that additional speed that is required for your front-end user experience. You don't have to send requests out to other pieces of hardware in order to get the information that you need. And not only that, but if you're interacting from the other way where you're writing to your database, again, it's in a close, close proximity to your database, so you don't have to do much or the response time would uh, be impaired because of that. Hardware consolidation, this is a big one. We talked about TCL a little bit, but again, if you have multiple um, systems, multiple pieces of hardware, such as you have your transactional system, you have your analytical system, you have your web server, you're talking about different pieces of hardware um, throughout your architecture, throughout your landscape, and they may be hosted in different locations. Now we have one appliance that's uh, satisfying all three of those pieces um, and allows you to really reduce your overall hardware and consolidate that. We're simplifying the development environment. Um, within the HANA Studio tool, which is the rich client, or the Web IDE, which is the thin client, web-based browser, browser-based, um, you have all of these, uh, you could do everything all within these tools. So you don't really have to leave and open up multiple tools to do your, web, your, your native application development because it's all provided within one um, one location. I'm going to switch over to the right side now and talk about, again, any data. This really ties back to what Wes was talking about when he was discussing that ETL approach with, with um, extracting data and loading it into, into SAP HANA as one uh, method. But really, any data source can be extracted. And we'll show you some of those during the, during the data services portion of the demo. It's device agnostic, which is extremely important to understand that, that responsive nature. Really, SAP UI5 is going to allow that to happen, and really uh, leveraging those libraries and creating that consistent approach across all your applications makes this data device agnostic, not only data source agnostic, but now we're talking device uh, agnostic. And all these applications that we're creating are going to be reusable. We're going to be um, embedding these within widgets, and these widgets could then be um, determined which users should have access to which widgets and allow you to create that um, additional security level uh, within your application. So, And also, you don't have to recreate the wheel for every group of users or type of user. We're going to be creating an application that can, be sat that can satisfy many users. And last but not least, we're increasing our IT output and we're reducing our IT costs. So the screen that I'm showing you here is the, the development tools. This is the browser-based uh, code editor, and this is what we will be showing you and how we could um, uh, start creating this application that we're speaking about on top of the data that will be extracted and loaded by, uh, by Wes's portion of the demo. Um, and this really, it allows you to do that, uh, all your JavaScript, all your HTML pages, all your access, uh, O data services type of scripting, everything that needs to be done within your application can be done within this framework. And in addition, you could also create your modeling. You could do all your modeling that against the lower level database directly in this tool. So it's really, flexible, and this is SAP's vision moving forward, that everything's going to transition slowly from HANA Studio into this front-end tool. But HANA Studio is the alternative. Many of us on the phone have probably worked with this versus the Web IDE, 
because again, this is a, a transition that's uh, that's that's working, um, that's in place right now, and it's and it's slowly evolving to satisfy uh, many different aspects of the Honda Studio uh, rich client. So let's just give a summarization so far of what we have spoken about. We have talked about the ETL process. We have stated exactly what options you have and the different benefits. We've discussed what, native, what SAP HANA is. It's a database. It's also an application, a web server, and how native applications fit on top of, these, uh, of, of this within the overall picture of the platform. So we really consolidated this vision now from the uh, getting the data, retrieving the data, loading in its SAP HANA, modeling that data, and consuming that data within an application. So those are the different points. And now what type of use cases do we have for this, you may be asking. And it depends, of course, on where you, you are as a customer, if you're, uh, you're focused within the SAP environment or your new SAP customers, meaning you're not SAP data, but you're still a new SAP customer from a HANA standpoint. And one great use case that I could provide for a new SAP customers would be maybe you have a very complex um, Excel-based, uh, you know, solution internally, and you really want to transition that because obviously that Excel-based solution provides a lot of manual risks. You know, there's a lot of uh, data entry within that, and a lot of those lookups um, and the, the complexities that go into all of those complex calculations can become not as scalable as your business grows. So maybe you need to transition that into an infrastructure um, which is a clean and seamless application. You want that light, clean application front end as stated here. And, and, and But not limit the amount of data that you can load, leverage, consume, and actually create those calculations again. And this would be a perfect scenario to do that type of um, effort. And then, of course, the extension of existing SAP functionality, that could be numerous things. Maybe you just want an application that's, uh, that's a huge gap within your current uh, business that uh, wants, and you want to leverage current baddies or uh, function modules or other APIs that are within your framework that you need to leverage within an application to create that consistent approach. Now, I just wanted to quickly, before we get into this demo, we're, we're coming up on the demo portion, um, I just want to discuss the HANA UI deployment steps. The point of this slide is, is this isn't anything magical. Um, we shouldn't be a fear of the native application world. This is just like any other project. There's the specific steps that go through all the methodologies that everyone has used, um, and it's no different when creating a, a native application. Um, some of the steps here is we would design the UX, so the user interface. You know, we would create a wire frame, uh, a mock-up of what that actually looks like. And then we identify each of those UI components and the interaction between them. So really, we create this wireframe of different pages, what your application looks like, and then how they interact with each other. And one of the points I want to make here is you may have a lot of APIs already embedded within your architecture. And you don't you, you, you do not necessarily want to recreate those within the SAP framework or the SAP platform. But what's great and what we will show you in the application is, is that you could actually leverage those with the SAP application, native application development. So you don't have to, it's not going to be throwaway. It's just going to be the integration part into the native application that we're going to create. So there's going to be communication between these different environments. Um, and the scenario that we're going to be showing is with Google Maps. Google Maps is not an SAP product, obviously, but we're going to show that interaction between those two products. And then the last, last three steps are you're going to design and develop those components, design the application site. Again, what user should see which widgets, and then you're going to launch your page. So our demo solution background, just to give you a little storyline of what we're going to show, is we are a sporting goods company, and we're specializing in supplying professional sporting facilities. So 
Um, we're going to be delivering um, different types of product to NFL stadiums and college stadiums across the U.S. Um, and what we want to answer and understand is what, where are our current shipments and which shipments are delayed. And this, what this is going to do is provide actionable results, meaning we can track all in-transit shipments in real time. Again, we're going to be loading this in a real time or near real time, depending on uh, which tool that you're using from an ETL standpoint. And this is going to allow us to quickly respond to delayed shipments. Instead of waiting for our customers to call and complain, we're now going to have that um, solution in place so we can respond before our customers do, and that's the key for, all, for, all for this. So with that said, at this point, I would like to have Kate uh, transition the presenting status to Wes, and he will show us how to set up a basic data services data flow as he spoke about earlier. All right. Can everybody see my screen at this point? I think so. Yes. Great. <clears throat> All right. So what, we, what you're seeing right here, thanks, Tim, uh, and thanks, Kate, for, for switching me over. Um, what you see here is the data services development environment, the, the data services designer, as it's called. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you've got the project list at the top and the local object library at the bottom. Uh, on the right, you can see the start page at this point, but as we start to create the project, uh, this is where you'll see the canvas uh, for the various objects we're working with. Um, we're going to create a new project here and give it a name. We'll just call it Project HANA Demo. <clears throat> All right. Then we're going to create ourselves a batch job, and I just right-click here and, and create that for me. So I'll give it a name here, Batch HANA. It's called Hunter, right? Demo. Okay, so now what we see over here, like I was saying before, this is the canvas uh, that we're going to start really dropping our objects on. In this case, we're going to need a workflow object, and we'll do our workflow here. Oops, that's my naming convention. And then we'll drill into this workflow, and we'll drop ourselves data flow. Data flow, and do this quickly. And finally, as we drill in the data flow, this is where you really um, start to see where you're going to, you know, create your data connections. So as I um, as I get to here, I'm going to kind of stop for a second and kind of show you a few of the connections that I spoke about earlier in the in the benefits. Now, over here in the local object library, I've created a couple of them um, already, just to kind of give you a, a feel for what uh, I was talking about before. In this case, these data stores are either the databases, applications, adapters, and so forth that, that you are able to connect to. Um, this first one here that I made has, uh, has a connection to uh, Dickinson's um, SAP ECC application. And in fact, uh, I've made a connection to a couple different tables. You guys might recognize these if you're SAP users. Uh, one's for production order confirmations, one's for general customer data, one for sales orders. Uh, we won't use these today because I want to really show you that you don't have to use SAP data. The other one here that I've got is actually the connection to HANA uh, that Tim will be using later in his uh, his portion of the demo. But the reality is it's a fairly simple setup, right? You just go through and connect like that. Now, uh, in terms of what we're going to connect to, I made some flat files, and I spoke about this earlier um, you know, these are more traditional type data sources. In this case, I've got, I've got a couple of flat files that I've already used in, in some other um, demonstrations, and they're still available in your library here. They know where, they're, where they should reside at. So as you pull them in, the location or the, um, the, the folder address is kind of embedded within this, um, within the, the details here. And you can see this very easily here. Um, what you've got, you can see some, some general parameters on the left-hand side, the field names that it found uh, as you pulled in the file uh, the first time. And even here on, on the right lower portion is a, a kind of a preview of some of the data. 
and we're going to use this particular this example right here and uh, and just drag and drop this onto our canvas. Now it, it wants to know is this the source of the target? Okay, we're going to make it the source. In terms of what we're going to deliver to, we're going to make a template table. In fact, what will happen as as this data flow is is completed or, or the batch job is run, the the table will get created inside SAP HANA. So we'll just drop this right here. And we're going to make this a new name. We'll call it table HANA demo. And you can see that that data store I spoke about uh, just a moment ago is the one that it's referenced here. So I'm going to create this. So now we really have our, our source and our target. But in the middle, we're going to have a, have the requirement for a transform, right? We're going to do a little bit of work on this thing. The reality is we don't even have to do this. We could take it straight from this this um, comma separated file and drop it right on 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 Hana, and it would create the table just fine. We don't necessarily want that. We don't want to have all the fields uh, brought over. So what, what you'll use uh, very commonly are these query transforms. And again, you can take this directly from the toolbar and drop it right on your canvas. We'll give it a name. All right, and then we're going to make the connections, right? And it's it's as simple as a drag and drop. I'm going to take my little pencil and drag it over here and drop on this connector. And then again, we're going to drag it over here and drop this connector. So what I'm telling it is take data from here, move it through the transform, and then drop it on the table. In order for us to define what fields come through, we drill into the query. And you can see the, the inbound schema on the left here has got all the fields that we defined in the in the uh, the text file. We're going to take just a few of them, maybe this first, I don't know, eight, what is that, eight fields. And again, it is quite simple. You drag and drop it over to the outbound schema. Now, the one thing Tim spoke about a moment ago when he was kind of uh, leading into the demo was that we're going to be able to do some work here. And that's exactly what I want to show you right now is that we're going to use this estimated delivery date as um, as a bit of, uh, of code for us to define a new column. And that's what we're doing here is we're going to define a new output. And we'll stick it below and we'll call it late delivery flag. We're going to call this just a single string character because the result we want is if this, this estimated delivery date has something that is in the past, then we're going to call it late and we'll just give it an X. If it is today or in the future, then we consider it not late. And you know, the, the concept here is that as we continue to, to bring data through here over and over again, you know, the, the data it's being, that's being submitted to us, um, it'll be processed through this, this bit of code. Now, as I finish this, hit OK, down here we need to tell it what it is that, that we're going to uh, use in, in terms of deciding whether it's late or not. Now, if you're familiar with Excel, and I expect many of you are, um, the, the definition here is, is quite similar, you know, no different than you'd write a formula. So I'm going to use this if, then, else. We're going to say, well, I've got to make sure that this text file up here, this delivery date, it's a character type thing. So I need to make sure that, that uh, data services considers it as a date. So I'll switch that. We'll make sure we're going to address the right field. And it's called estimated delivery date. Close parentheses, and we're going to make sure it thinks of it as month, day, year. And then we'll compare that to another built-in function called system date, which is basically today's date. And then if that that comparison is true, then we'll use an X. If not, we'll just use blank. So you might think, well, this is pretty simple. And it, the reality is it is. It's, it's very similar to what you find, um, you know, if you did a formula in Excel. So we're going to apply that. 
it seems to like it. Now, one of the things that, that is, is also very helpful when you're doing these mappings um, within data services is you can validate what you've, what you've done. And there's a very nice little function here to say validate. And as I expected, <laughs> we found no errors. And this is, this is great. If there were some errors, it would tell you, listen, I've got some concerns. Data services will give you kind of a, a description of what might come up. In this case, thankfully, we have no errors. So we're going to have to save this now. And we'll just say OK. Now, what we're going to do is, as I spoke about before, there is a management console. And the way to execute this thing so that it pulls the data correctly is we go to this management console. And this is generally found here in your web browser. And what what I want to do before I get into the actual execution is tell you a little bit about what you see on the screen here. Uh, for more complex flows, you can actually have data services document what you've done. Uh, you can see some data validation uh, reporting. You've got a, a very robust operational dashboard. And then down here, you can even see some of the data quality reporting. So the uh, the, the point of this is to tell you, listen, this is not um, a kind of a, a new product. This is a very um, full-grown uh, management tool in addition to being a, a very robust platform for data integration. So what we're going to do now uh, is go into the administration here as a uh, as we drill into our batches here that we just uh, there are batch jobs we just created, and I'm going to execute that that one. Now here we found the one we just created here, batch Hana demo. We're going to execute. And what that'll do is actually go through the whole steps that we just defined uh, in the designer. You can see some of the parameters here that you've got. Uh, in fact, you can do a, a significant number of, of tracing here. Um, we don't need to have that, that amount of detail. We're just going to execute. And as it runs, uh, we'll look into the details very quickly and see if it, if it was successful. All right, so it says it started, it's processing, and let's see from the end. Hopefully, we'll have a success message. And there we go. Very At the very end here, we said job so-and-so, uh, batch, batch demo, completed successfully. <clears throat> and one of the cool things is that when we get back to data services, we can actually flip back into our data flow. And now, this was a table that we were expecting to build. We can actually view the results. So here, as you see in some of these uh, some of these rows, this stuff is old, right? And it got the flag correctly. Now I hope that we've got some data in there. Oh yeah, there it was. You've got some data in here, like this is uh, sometime next month. And in fact, that late flag came through at the blank. So when it gets to the application development side that Tim's going to describe, this data will be appropriate for what. Uh, for when we pulled this in. Um, I'm going to pass it back over to you. I think uh, my side of the demo is done, and you've got your data now. Can you, um, Wes, real quick, did you show the different um, data sources um, with the SQL and stuff? Yeah. So in here, well, you know what? That's a great point, Tim. Um, I spoke about what these two were that I created before. These are the data stores that I have in play. Let me just kind of do one, uh, and we won't save it because I don't necessarily have a, a good example for you, but this is the way you create a new data store and the, the types that you have available to you. These are just the databases uh, that are available to you. Let me just drop down here. Uh, what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have you know, DB2, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL. These are the ones that come native out of the box. You can see that there's many more than I suggested. Um, so these are just the database side. Uh, these are just the databases that you can connect to natively. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, let's just take Oracle as, as an example. And um, one of the things that, that we have spoke about in other uh, presentations was the change data capture. It basically, the, the, and it looks at, as the, at the database tables. It can say, hey, listen, did anything change? And if so, pull that through. Um, what other things we've got available to us? These are the other types of connections you can make, and I mentioned these a little bit uh, previously. 
J.D. Edwards, Oracle applications. People saw, and of course, the SAP applications, that these are all included. Uh, I mentioned SOAP as well. Um, but th there's just such a wide variety of databases, data connections, data applications that you can connect to, uh, making this thing such a tremendously powerful and flexible tool. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I just want to make sure that we know that one piece. You so can you make me the presenter again, please? Tim, you should have the controls now. Okay. Can, I don't know if you could, you can't see my screen, can you? No, we cannot. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, that was great, Wes. It really showed how we could integrate that data, that external data, into our SAP HANA environment. So what I'm going to first start off with is to show you the end state of where we're going to be at. Again, we're not going to be able to go through every component, but really – what I want to be able to display to everyone is that application that we want to create and also how you can display it to your end users so you can understand that end-to-end -end product that we've been discussing. So this is my uh, SAP HANA logon screen. So this would be my portal that I, I would uh, – landing page that I want to load uh, – to log into. So I will do that. Hopefully, I put my credentials in right, and we can get to the next page. So, what's going to come up here is it's going to be it's going to lay out for us that nice look and feel of the different, as I spoke about earlier, those applications or widgets. So, on this page, you can see different tiles. I, I can call them, and each of these tiles are related to an application or that widget. And Right here, we're showing nine different ones uh, from uh, input screens to our shipment tracker in the end here, which we will be speaking about. But by to user to user, depending on who it is, you could limit this to one or all nine different tiles. And that's really the, the benefit and that reusability of those widgets that we uh, have spoken about. So if I click on any of these, I'm going to click on the shipment tracker first it's going to open up that application that we're going to just, we're going to continue to build through. And there's two portions of this. I spoke about the API integration with Google Maps. You can see that on the bottom here. And right now, right now it's just focusing on Chicago, and there's nothing really to it other than telling us that um, the different uh, cities and locations within the uh, area. And on the top here is the data that Wes just loaded, the different uh, – transactions, a uh, shipment that we are sending to our different destinations. So as you, as you can see, we're going for the Detroit Lions. We're sending some to Michigan and each of these transactions. And then on the right side, we're, you, we're showing something of an estimated delivery, but these are in red. So we, we now took that flag that Wes created that's stating that it's a late delivery and within this application, we highlighted those in red and are only displaying those. So for our cases, we want to look at the late shipment. So we took that X, we translated it into our, uh, our, our application, and we're displaying just those, but also displaying those in red. So if you do determine to add to show all shipments, we could have that differentiation between what's late and what's not. Um, now, if I click on any of these lines or transactions, you will then see the Google map on the bottom change and to show where the shipment currently is and where it's supposed to be going to. So it has that interactive capability that I can now do those, execute those actionable items and determine, okay, I need, this was estimated to deliver on July 3rd, but this truck is only about three quarters of the way to State College, okay? Obviously, there's an issue. Obviously, the data is old as well because if it took them uh, over uh, two months to do this, we'd have a, lo a larger issue. But the point here is now I can go through each of our delayed deliveries, determine where they currently reside within the overall geospatial map that I've created, and, and react to that accordingly, either calling the driver 
or determining if there was anything else that was happening. Maybe it did make it to the customer and something wasn't entered into the system correctly. So now let's go back to uh, the main landing page again, and I just want to show you some other types of applications prior to jumping in because we're showing in this in the shipment tracker we're showing the data that's already been uh, entered into the system. But as a non-SAP customer, I was talking about that use case earlier about that ex complex Excel-based solution that you had, and you want to translate that into input screens that you're now allowing. Uh, you know, that, that the end user interaction, not with an Excel document, but with a seamless and a light, clean front end. So here I could have a normal, uh, you know, input screen where I could enter data, and as I create the information, it's writing directly to the HANA database. Again, the, since everything sits on that HANA platform, it's communicating in a very uh, easy manner through that con control flow technologies portion that we spoke earlier about and writing directly to the HANA database. But also within this SAP UI5 libraries, we have different types of validations that come out of the box. So let's just say I'm typing in a phone number of just 216. I only answered three numbers. It knows to validate that, and it's highlighting it in red. Or if I have a you know email address that I am entering and I only put in a portion of it, it understands to validate those steps to highlight those for me and to make me aware of that information. So really that integration and embedded um, capabilities exist. So with that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log out as this user. I'm going to open up a new fresh browser just so um, we are starting fresh. And I'm going to enter the first URL that I want to get to. Now this is, um, again, some of this information you will, you will see. I'll, I'm just copying and pasting here from another screen. But what I'm going to be logging into at, is as a, um, a different developer. So I'm not logging in as myself, but I'm logging into that web IDE that I spoke about earlier. So that web IDE is that front end application tool that's going to allow you to do your development of your native application. Now, at first, the first time you log in, it does take a little bit of time because it's loading all the libraries and it's doing lots of different things in the background. And while that's loading, I'll give you an example of what SAP HANA Studio also looks like. SAP HANA Studio is that rich client, and really what it's doing, is, and I'll open up the perspectives that are available and, and show you everything that is uh, available. You can have debug and Java, uh, your JavaScript, you could do your HANA development and your modeling as well, your admin console. So you can really see the depth and breadth of this rich client tool and what it provides. So now let's start our new, uh, let's start into getting into creating that application that I spoke about. So now we've logged into our, our web uh, IDE, our application, and now, again, I want to create that first application. So simply, all I want to do is going to right click on this shipment tracker, hopefully. Taking some time here. Still loading some things. And I'm going to go down to create application. So again, we need to create our application first before we do anything. So I'm going to create the application and right up, right above it's going to provide me a capability to choose different templates. So the different templates are, we could have an empty application, which we're going to choose, and then we could have HANA XS Hello World, you know, UI5 Hello World, as well as Fury Event Feedback. And as this evolves, there's going to be more and more templates going to be provided by SAP. But I'm going to keep it as an empty uh, application, and I'm just going to just enter in my, my username that I just had, which is Workshop17. And it is case sensitive, so it's always a good um, standard to create uh, lowercase uh, moving forward. I hit the Create button, and it will create my package on the left-hand side. So now I've, it's created a new package called Workshop 17, and within this package I have different files that are automatically created for me. So if I look at the first one that really stands out to me, it's called XX Access. Stands out to me because something is uh, is tying to access. So this specific page is where you could do your security, your SSO, your SAML, 
those types of setups would be done here. So it's very, you could do a, numerous types of um, aspects here. Also, we're, we're defining what our default um, file is, our index HTML. You saw that an index HTML was created on the side here, and everybody knows what index HTML usually means. It's that home page to your application, and it's no different here. So, so with that said, why don't we go into launching our page and making sure that now that we have this application created, that we could actually launch it and see it um, operate and make sure that we are um, – our XS engine number one is up and running, and number two, what we did, uh, worked. So let me go up back into my uh, Google. So right off the bat, I have to type in my, my workshop name, because I have zero one in here. So I type in workshop 17, and it's going to bring me to that initial page that we created. Okay, let me just log in here again. So, as you can see, I open up Firefox instead of being in Chrome, so that's why it asked me to log back in. So, this is my web page. So, if we go back into our initial statement here and go to index HTML, again, our home page, we can see that it says, this is my web page. So, again, out of the box delivered, when you create that application, it's creating those base files for you in order for you to have something up and running in a reasonable amount of time. And we can, I'll just show you if I change this to something like this is my first native application. You can also see up here that it's being interactive to, to the developer. Something has changed, so this tab is in yellow. So simple things like that really makes this development process a little bit easier for you to use. So I would save this. I'll go back into my web page that I had, and I'll refresh it, and then I'll see that change. This is my first native application. So one other point that I want to make within this uh, access, access portion is that if, um, in order to control my development efforts, if we have many different pages within one application and we don't want them all exposed at one time, I can state that this is, is a fault and it's not being exposed until I'm done with the development process. So if I go back into my page and I refresh this, it's now going to give me an error that it's not found any longer because that page is currently in development. I don't want it to be exposed to anybody. And right now I can control that as a developer. And it's, again, making that ease of use um, for my overall process. So I will just go back in here, put this to true. Okay. So we, we, we've created our main application. We have identified that our XS engine is consuming that application correctly. We've shown where our security access can be done. Um, and one other file that I would like to, to do is our configuration, our component.js file. So there's a lot of different configuration that needs to be set up uh, initially. You want to know where your root view is, like what tables that you may be accessing, the different models. So in order to do that, I would go into new and file, but for the time, uh, a matter of um, time here, I will show you that component JS immediately in my other uh, package that I have. But as you can see, there's a lot of different code in here that as you start to develop applications, you'll understand further. But again, um, it, it does a lot of our main configuration that we need to have in order for our application to be developed and programmed effectively across the board. It does things such as defining our metadata, our de different text packages, and our global service definition, um, but which will be used, again, throughout the application and allow us to have that single source for those configuration settings um, all in one place. Now, I'm going to go back into Honda Studio real quick because I want to show you one other concept which is going to tie back everything that we just spoke about, which is the modeling. So, uh, Wes, he was able to load a table and into SAP HANA. Now, we've talked about creating that native application that we have shown the end game for. We've created that basic framework for that application, 
but we also have to do that modeling, that piece in between it. So we're talking about the data technologies layer within the initial screen. This is a simple calculation view that you're looking at, which shows the base tables in the bottom and then some different aggregations that I'm doing or projections across the board. This could be any joins that you're doing, left outer, right outer, outer, inner, those types of aspects as well as unions. So this is where your data modelers will actually take all those tables that were loaded from data services, model the data, and make it consumable, consumable for that application that you're building. So it really shows that end-to-end -end integration here. So I know we've talked about a lot of different components, concepts here. Uh, let me just jump back to our presentation real quick. Um, this application that we talked about could, could evolve to many different future considerations. You could do real-time fleet tracking. You could do advanced notifications, meaning that as stuff gets uh, late, you could start to put alerts in uh, within the portal so you could see those every time you log on uh, or email, so on and so forth. So, you know, there's different potential use cases here uh, just against the shipment tracker in general, that application. But I'm sure your, your mind may be thinking of many different things and how you could apply it to your company, which is great, and I hope that that has evolved to that point now. Some other things that I want to highlight here is we do have our Dickinson, and Web, our Dickinson Associates website. We have a blog where you can actually uh, go to and uh, um, – see the, this video again. It will be placed out there so you can see the recording. So if you want to share this with any of your colleagues. We also have a Dickinson Associates channel. You can search for Dickinson Associates or you can use this link. It will also be posted out there on that channel. There's other um, webinars that we have done over the past. We could also provide you this code if you would like, um, but please uh, follow us on Twitter and either at Dickinson and Associates or at Tim Corva and send us a direct message asking, asking for this code in order to create the shipment tracker uh, application, and we could uh, support you there in, in creating maybe the delivery unit for you. Um, a survey monkey will be sent out, so please provide any uh, input for future courses. This is uh, We may have additional follow-up exercises, but add on our YouTube channel, we're expecting to have the other portions of how to create the application so you can see it in real life and actually be able to apply it within your uh, your company. So with that said, I did pick up on a couple of questions as we were going, as, as actually as Wes was, was typing along, I, I, I wrote a couple down that I saw. And one, Wes, was tied to um, how we can integrate. Um, we talk, they, they, they were talking about how you had one data source and they were asking if how you, can you integrate multiple data into one table or into multiple tables? I think you're on mute, Wes. Yep, I was on mute. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. That is that is possible. You can take um, source data from multiple connections. <clears throat> For example, an Oracle table, an SAP table, um, even a flat file. <coughs> Pardon me and consolidate that all into one uh, one HANA table. Now, that, that would take um, um, a couple different elements within our data flow, but definitely that is, that is truly something that is, is possible and, and honestly not that complex. Okay. And then um, uh, one other one real quick. I know we're running out of time here. Um, uh, they, about initial data loads, uh, I'm, I'm a, I think that they mean is, they have a large initial data load, and what concepts may be a benefit with using data services? Is there a way to support large data loads? Sure, sure, absolutely. On the on the definition of your um, of your resulting table, right, the the HANA table that I that I created before, there's an option called bulk load, and you can do that, uh, and, and it would take massive uh, amounts of data through there and, and kind of stick it in uh, in a very uh, very efficient manner. Okay, okay. And then um, I do have one other one that was tied more to native applications, kind of like it was it was it's spreading across both, I would say. But in data services, 
that you, Wes, you loaded the data directly via the data services tool, but is there a way to do the same type of um, capability within HANA? And I, the, the answer to that question is, is yes. There's many ways to do that. Um, and within our native application framework, we showed the different packages that existed. We could actually do the definitions with for those tables directly in something called core data services or within the same pack with one of within one of those packages. So instead of West defining the actual metadata for that table, we could do that within our overall native application and then that will allow us to use LCM to push it uh, the tables from one system, one uh, environment to the other. Uh, for instance, from dev to queue to production. And then Wes would then be able to uh, create his data services against that HANA table that was already created and create his definitions against that. So that's another method that we can do using SAP HANA platform. And with that said, I am one minute over. Uh, so, Kate, I will turn it back over to you and uh, uh, closing the web webinar. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, and have a good day.